the first generation F1 to F1 bill, we're losing half of our heterosis. Okay. You lose half of your heterosis. But from that point in time, if you do not inbreed, in other words, if you don't use the same sire lines when you're breeding your half-bloods and your half-bloods, you maintain that level of heterosis 50%. And we account for that, like Lauren said, we can account for that. We know that an F1 or you're mating two totally unrelated parents, you're gonna get maximum heterosis, 100% heterosis. But when you go back and do the back cross, you're losing half of the heterosis. So ideally, what commercial cattlemen, ideally if they wanna maximize heterosis, they need to be crossing their parent lines, their sire and dam lines need to be unrelated. But that's not, there's kind of a trade-off between practicality and idealism. Idealism is you always want 100% heterosis. Well, that means you gotta figure out a way to make sure that all your, your sires and all your dams are not related. Or are out of totally different breeds. And so that's where hybrid cattle have come in. And yes, you do lose some hydrosis when you're doing back crossing, but it's better than nothing. But on that note, Bill, yeah. that is one of the things, and I feed my BS into these guys as much as I can on predicting when this new quantum leap system comes out, something that I've really been promoting among the, the geneticists, is giving us an inbreed coefficient corresponding with each animal. So if you know where you're at, and th this isn't an easy thing to do, but I understand that that is going to be a possible benefit of quantum leap system is, there's a chance, I don't know, wait to tell you for sure, if it's, if it's possible, but as far as I know, with the computing power that we'll have at our disposal, we'll have a chance so that when you're making a mating, you can get an answer on the percent inbreeding in that mating. Thank you. Is that right, Wade? That's right. So, so we're going to shift gears a little bit here. Um, going to still talk about. Going to still talk about the science. But so I think Lauren and uh, Jackie did a great job of talking about how we get at genetic level. Okay. So EPD simply our prediction of an animal's genetic level for whatever trait they're calculated on. What I want to do is take us to a place, how do we use those genetic levels? What do we do when we have a set of EPDs? What's the next step? Mike Duncan, what's the next step? We gotta make some sense out of those EPDs, right? right. Consider the economic return from that. Sure. And then ultimately, right. we're all to, ultimately, we need to have feedback from consumers of our beef product. Sure. Michael went to exactly where a meat scientist would go. The <laughs> end product. And the end product is critical. It's important. It's very important. So, what we're going to do today, and this is going to be interactive, so I'm going to be asking a lot of questions. Okay, and so obviously we take this information, we have genetic levels, right? Okay, then somehow we have to take those genetic levels and we have to decide if we want more milk or less milk. We have to decide if we need lots of cavities or maybe we get five or not so much cavities. Okay, so I'm getting towards what we call in the world of animal science or animal breeding economic indexes or selection indexes. And I want you to raise your hand. This is a trick question. I gave this trick question several years ago, and I did trick quite a few people, so I'm counting on doing that again. How many of you, when you make your selection decisions, use an index? 
I think more of you should raise your hands. Actually, everyone, if you make any selection decisions, like it or not, you're using an index. It might be your own index, but it's an index, okay? So, and it might be written down on a piece of paper, it might be just in your head, and you might do it when you're just sitting in a sail barn, the bulls are flying by you, <laughs> but you've got some index you're putting together to make that selection decision. So what I want to talk about this morning is an index, of the theory of the economic selection index, the scientific method of applying using all of these EPDs that we put together that Lauren and Jackie talked about, these genetic levels, and actually coming up with the mathematically correct weightings on all of those EPDs. A fellow named Lenoy Hazel back in 1943 actually came up with selection index theory. He was at Iowa State at the time. We've got a graduate of Iowa State back there, Bert Moore. We've got a graduate of Iowa State right here, Gordon Jones, Dr. Gordon Jones. How many other Iowa State grads do we have? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Scott over there. Bert, okay. So anyway, Iowa State at one time was kind of the center of the universe when it came to animal genetics and breeding. Yes, and it, it has come full circle. So, what Lenoy Hazel said is that we can mathematically, based on the economics and the biology, we can mathematically put the correct weighting that will allow us to make the most profit, to maximize profit. And that was the economic selection. Okay? So, it is predicated on, we have to, and I always call it genetic accounting. That's really all it is. It's not any magic hocus pocus. You guys have done any accounting. You know, and accounting is really pretty straightforward. At least the, the basis of it is straightforward. You know, you've got your, your dollars of output, and you subtract off how much input it costs you to create that output. That gives you your profit, right? And that's really all economic selection indexes do. They calculate the differences in profit between sires. You're gonna use sire A versus sire B. Economic selection indexes will predict the difference in profit you would expect between those sires. So they're predicated, the first thing we have to do, the first thing we have to do is we have to determine which traits are economically relevant. Okay, and I'm gonna define that, and I'm gonna ask you guys, I'm gonna throw out a series of traits, and I wanna get, get your thumbs up or thumbs down whether or not they're economically relevant. So an economically relevant trait is a trait that an accountant would need. If you're working with an accountant to calculate the profit in your operation, they would be the set of traits that an accountant needs to have. Okay, so let's start out with, is birth weight an economically relevant trait? How many say yes? That's kind of half, halfway up. How many say no? Birth weight is not an economically relevant trait. You would be right. Birth weight is not an economically relevant trait because what would your accountant do if you, if you told your accountant you had you average 90 pounds for birth weight, what does that tell your accountant? Nothing. Doesn't tell your accountant anything. Scroll circumference. Economically relevant trade or no? No. I always say the only way scroll circumference is an economically relevant trade is if you're selling Rocky Mountain oysters. <laughs> Outside of that, it's not economically relevant. Now the thing about these trades I'm throwing out, I'm not saying they aren't important biological traits, but their importance is due to their relationship to other traits that are economically relevant. So for birth weight, what's birth weight related to? Canonese. And ultimately, what's the economically relevant trait? Survival, right there. Dr. Gordon Jones says survival rate. So we know if we have a gauge of birth weight cavities, birth weights in the category EPD, we can predict survival rate, okay? So, survival rates, one economically relevant trait, put that up there. Jackie? 
survival rate. And what are the EPDs again that are related to survival rate? Cavities, what else? Earthquake. And luckily, let's take that off, Jackie, because luckily, in our system, earthquakes already factored into cavities, so we have it in. Okay, there's another type of cavities that we forgot about that actually affects survival, right? Maternal cavities. Because if we have a bull inside his daughters that have it easier, the survival rate's going to be higher, right? And so we know we can go and we can calculate the relationship between cavities and survival rate, and it's quite strong. It's actually the genetic relationship in most any study has shown that the survival rate between cavities, or the, the relationship between cavities and survival rate is quite strong. Maternal cavities, cow or bulls that have daughters that calve more easily, they're more likely to have live daughters. Okay, so Jackie is showing here, we're on the output. We've got, okay, I'll start out again. We've got cow-calf feedlot packing plant. And we're talking about API now, our all-purpose index, and that covers everything. That covers the cow-calf feedlot and packing plant. So now we're in the cow-calf phase. What's the other factor? When it comes to your, what's your major output in the cow-calf operation? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, pounds, pounds of calves, okay? So what do we need up there besides survival rate to get pounds of calves? Weeding weight, exactly. Weeding weight is an economically relevant trait because that's a trait we get the cow-calf production or the cow-calf enterprise gets paid on weeding weight. So between these two things, and what's the indicator trade for weaning weight? Weaning weight. <laughs> Guys are pretty sharp. So anyway, we have these two traits. So if you were to count, what can you do with those two traits? You have 100 cows, you're going to count them, and you, you're looking at this operator, it's got 100 cows, what do those traits tell you? How many calves are alive? So if you multiply, you got a 95% survival rate. You got 100 cows, you got a 95% survival rate, you got 95 calves, right? Okay, and then if you take it times the weight, if they weaned off 550 pounds, that tells you how many pounds are gonna come out of that enterprise, okay? So what's another, what's another output trait, economically relevant output trait in cow calf operation? Yeah. Cow cows, salvage, salvage cows, cow cows. So that basically is salvage weight, right? We have the salvage weight that gives us, that gives an account of what they need to know about the output coming out of your cow calf operation. So that actually covers the output trace in a cow calf operation. Not a lot of murder. Right? If you know the, if you know the weaning weight and how many calves survive, that gives you the pounds of output, of pounds of output of calf product, the salvage weight gives you the output of cow product. Now let's talk about input. What is the major input? Oh, indicator of, uh, the indicator APD would be mature weight. So input, and I'm coming at you, Craig, now. So what would be the major input trait, economically relevant input trait, in the cow-calf operation? Right, how much a cow eats. So cow intake, let's say cow intake. Okay, any of you keep track of what each of your cows eat? Probably not. How can we possibly get a cow intake? How are we gonna, how in the world, it's important, I just said it's the most important input trait in the cow-calf operation, how do we get at it? How do we get at differences between sires, we're trying to get at differences in, between sires in their daughter's intake. How do we get at that? Weight, Lauren Jones says weight in milk production, Gordon is right on the money. So between those two traits, if we have a good gauge of what a bull's daughters are going to 
Now, the, the milk level and their size, their genetic milk level and size, that gives us a pretty good prediction of what they're going to eat. Are there some that are going to eat more than you'd expect based on their milk level? Yes, some less, you bet. But on the average, we can do a pretty good job. You know, you're not going to find a cow the size of a squirrel that's going to eat like an elephant and vice versa. You know, there are biological limitations here. So generally, with these two traits, milk and mature weight, we can actually predict cow intake pretty good. So what else is an intake trait or a, an input trait when it comes to cow-calf operation? This one's pretty critical, and you might not think of it as an input trait. You might actually think of it as an output trait. Yeah. Cavities actually have got up there in survival rate. Reproduction. Reproduction. Reproduction, and specifically if you're, if you're an accountant, what do you need to know about reproduction? Well, you need to have a replacement, right? You need to know how many animals per year that operator is going to replace, right? If they have a 50% replacement rate, versus a 20% replacement rate, that's going to have a big impact on profit. Okay? And also, here's the thing you can consider to input and output. If you have a high replacement rate, what does that tell you about the number of salvage animals? You're going to have lots. If you have a high replacement rate, a lot of your output is going to come from cull cows. If you have a low replacement rate, a lot of your salvage, or a lot of your output is going to come from heifers that are going to go in the feedlot, right? And why is that better? Jimmy, why is it better to have a low replacement rate? You've got that in the end here. Paying the replacement And those replacements, to get a replacement into production is pretty dang expensive. So if a cow stays bred, and you can take that heifer calf and sell her, because you don't need her, you can sell her, I guess you could sell her theoretically as a bred heifer, or you could sell her as a breeding animal, or you could sell her in a feedlot, and that's much higher price than your salvage value. You're talking quite a bit difference in value. So it's very critical, in fact, it turns out in the whole system, right there, that replacement rate is the most critical factor of everything in the system. So how do we get at replacement rate? What do we have for EPDs? Stayability. Stayability gives us a good gauge of replacement rate in cow calf. Okay, now let's go to the feedlot. The feedlot. What are the economically relevant traits in the feedlot? Growth. 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 Let's call it average daily gain. Average daily gain, if we know the average daily gain, and if you're an accountant and somebody tells you, well, I have an average daily gain of four pounds a day on the average in the feedlot, and I fed them for 150 days, that tells you how count what? How many pounds of output that came out of the feedlot? Okay, what's the other? And then where do we get, where do we get average daily gain? What indicator trait do we use? What do we have now, Sally? We just introduced a new EPD. Average day of the game. And the reason we introduced that EPD, I was going to ask you, how many people think yearling weight is an ERT, economically relevant trade? I'm glad to see no has in there because it is not an economically relevant trade. It's for some reason we decided a long time ago that and people used to even do this out of the contemporary group. They'd take the animal 365 days and weigh it, and then if it was heavy, they'd broadcast it, and they were really happy. The truth is, yearling weight is not an economically relevant trait. Average daily gain is an economically relevant trait, and they aren't the same thing by any stretch. So that's why we added average daily gain. It truly is the economically relevant trait. What's the other, what's the, what's the trait the input trait, that, that's actually the only output trait you have to deal with in the feedlot. What's the input trait in the feedlot? Feed. Feed. Feedlot intake. Okay? So 
that's pretty straightforward. We're just, this is just genetic accounting. So then we look over to the packing plant. We've got everything we need, output, input, the feedlot. We go over to the packing plant. What are the economically relevant output traits in the feedlot? What do we get paid on? Carcass weight? Growth? Yep, right. <coughs> and size. Oh, I forgot feedlot intake indicator traits. It's a good thing I have somebody that's on the ball here. So we'll go back. So can we measure intake in the feedlot in individual animals? You bet we can. Is it expensive, Craig Hayes? Craig Hayes is one of the few breeders out there that actually has an intake system. We had an intake system to collect feed intake, but it's very expensive. We can, fortunately, we can do a reasonable job of predicting feedlot intake. Differences in sires and the amount their feedlot offspring will eat by using the things that Jackie just threw up there. Average daily gain, ribeye area, back fat, marbling. Okay, so why do we have those carcass traits up there? What do they tell us? They tell us, well, why do we have carcass traits including in predict, predicting feedlot intake? In other words, why are we using carcass traits to help predict feedlot intake? Doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Less ribeyes. Uh, uh, yeah, one of the things we know is that at the same growth rate, animals at the same growth rate, animals that are putting more of that growth on in fat are going to require more feed because fat requires more energy to put on. So if you have two animals growing at the same rate and one of them is putting on more fat, that animal is likely to be eating more. So that's why average daily gain is a very good predictor by itself of intake, correlation, genetic correlation of about 0.7. But when we have some sense, when we have those carcass rates, ribeye, area, back fat, marbling, that gives us some sense of the composition of that gain. And that allows us to fine tune that prediction of feed intake. Then let's move on, we move on. We have already had mentioned um, the crowd already threw out that uh, the economically relevant traits in the packing plant are, I think Jimmy said carcass weight, Gordon probably, or somebody said marbling, or quality grade, let's call it. And yield grade. And yield grade, right. And it turns out in the feedlot, when it comes to traits that are under genetic control, they really are only output traits. So those three characteristics on animals at the packing plant will give us, will give an accountant the data required to come up with a prediction of profit feedlot. Now what's missing here? We've got, right now we have all the biological traits, all the economically relevant traits we need to deal with. In the feedlot, or in the cow calf, we're talking about survival rate, Weaning weight, those two together give us the pounds of calf produced. Salvage weight, if we know salvage weight and replacement rate, tells us what kind of pounds of cows we're going to be selling out of the uh, cow calf operation and what the cows eat. Okay, that gives us everything we need to predict profit in the cow calf feedlot. We've got average daily gain and intake, and then the packing plant carcass weight, yield grade, marble. Quality readers. And Jackie will add in, obviously, what EPD would we use for carcass weight? The carcass weight EPD. Quality grade marbling. And finally, the yield grade, we have the yield grade EPD. Okay, what is missing? What, what, what else would an accountant need to calculate profit? Exactly. Needs a lot more than that. They need the prices and costs of everything. The prices and costs of everything. The price of corn, uh, the price of hay, the price of pasture, choice to select spread, the over and underweight prices, <coughs> discounts, everything, every economic parameter that affects profit needs to be plugged into here. 
So the way we do that, we use camel facts. Primarily, they come up with predictions. They predict, they use their economic models to predict the choice to select spread. They use their economic models to predict the price of corn. They use their economic models to predict most things that we need to know when it comes to beef cattle production. Okay, then what we do, here's what we do. We have a big computer simulation that was developed by USDA. That computer simulation lets us, it lets us mimic a cow herd. It produces a cow herd with average survival rates, average weaning weights, average salvage weights, average, every one of those economically relevant traits, they are mimicked or they are simulated at the average of the population. And then we run it with all the prices and costs in it. Then we run it and we look at the profit of that enterprise. In other words, what we're looking at is what would the profit be of an enterprise that was absolutely average for every economically relevant trade. That gives us a baseline. We've got a baseline now. Then what do we do? Well, then all we have to do is go trade by trade and change each trade one unit. So we change survival rate one unit. We change weaning weight one unit. We change all of these trades one by one. So we're going, we'll change survival rate one unit, we'll run the simulator, and we'll see how that impacts profit. And the difference between the baseline and the, the run where we've changed that economically relevant trade one unit, that gives us the weight to put on that trade. Okay? And we go through every one of those trades one by one, we change them one unit, and that tells us the weighting to put on those trades. So, often get asked, often get asked, with, uh, I'm very well aware that these indexes are controversial. Um, we've had them probably going on almost, uh, Steve, what would you say, 10 years? Ten years, they were one of the first breeds to introduce the economic selection indexes. Now, when pigs and chickens, long, many decades ago, and Gordon Jones will tell you this, pigs and chickens have had economic selection indexes for decades. And as I said, they were first introduced in 1943. So we know they work. There's no question whatsoever about the fact they work. But there are questions about the weightings, okay? And that's legitimate. Now, we're doing one-size-fits-all indexes, okay? We're coming up with prices and costs based on cattle facts. There might be situations where if you're selling out the West Coast, you might sell beef to Harris Beef. You might sell your cattle to Harris Beef. And under those circumstances, marbling gets a heavier weight. Okay? There's all kinds of other things, other parameters that might not be exactly like what we plugged into these indexes. But what we found with these indexes is they're pretty dang robust. In other words, you can change the prices and costs. You can change the averages. You might have a very high average marble. You can change the biological averages. And for the most part, they still rank sires pretty similar. They still do a pretty good job of ranking sires in there. Now we're kind of forced to do a one size fits all. You can have, you can develop customized indexes, they do it in the pig world. But I've talked to pig geneticists and they'll tell you, for the most part, what they found is a lot of times it's not even worth the extra hassle because the pigs are ranked so similarly with and without the customized index. Now one of the things, the one of the things that always comes up is how in the world, how in the world can you tell me that all those prices and costs are going to be exactly on the money when I go to selling my calves or when I put my calves in the feed Well, I can tell you without any question, they're not going to be right on the money. They're not going to be right on the money. But that's one of the things we're faced with when we breed cattle. We're breeding cattle for down the road, right? We're breeding cattle for down the road, three, four, five years. We don't know what the prices are gonna be like then. But one thing we do know is 
that prices and costs tend to move in equilibrium. If the price of one input goes up, probably other inputs are going to go up as well as the price of some outputs. So the value of outputs. So things tend to move in equilibrium. And that's not always the case at any one point in time. And Kurt knows that. He's smiling. At any one point in time, you might have really high price corn and really low price cattle. But how long can that exist? That can't exist forever because at some point, if, if you have high price or high price corn forever and low price cattle, what's going to happen to the feedlot business? It's not, yeah, like Kurt said, it went bye bye. It's going bye bye. So over long term, prices and costs tend to move in equilibrium. And that's why one of the major reasons why these indexes are so effective. Because yeah, at one, any one point in time, things might be out of whack. There might be a $20 choice to select spread. That's probably not going to last forever. There might be no advantage to choice over select at a point in time. But on the average, it's about 10 bucks. It's about 10 bucks, and that's what we use. So anyway, with that, okay. Wrap it up. <laughs> so with that, yeah, we'll take a break. Unless, well, if anybody's got real quick questions, yeah, great. Well, one of my biggest concerns, maybe with, with some of the inputs we use, is is the assumption that everything's linear to to even to the extreme extent that we get a one one for one. <laughs> So what Craig Hayes is asking, he says, are we making an assumption that everything is linear? In other words, is, is one unit increase in a trade the same as two units, the same as three units? So if you take marble, as you go up the chain for marbling, is there a point where you either get more value or less value? Well, in the real world, <coughs> things aren't linear. They are not linear. In our, in our economic index, we are assuming linearity. For the most part, and there, are, there, are, there have been efforts to put together nonlinear indexes, but generally what they find is that they really don't gain you a lot. You don't gain a lot by having, fitting the nonlinearity between um, variables. In some cases, here's an example. If you have, if you bred a herd that is so good for marbling that all of your cattle hit prime, what's the advantage of increasing marbling? <coughs> As Lauren would say, zero. No advantage to increasing marbling. So if you take it to the extremes, there's no question that that there is diminishing or increasing <coughs> returns. But where we're at on the average, we're dealing with average population. And in those cases, in, in very, actually fairly wide ranges, it does hold to where it predicts differences in profit fairly well. But, but Craig did hit on one of the shortcomings. Now, one of the ways we deal with that is over time, every generation or two, we will update the parameters. We'll change the means. You know, it might be at one time our marbling level, the average marbling level was high, high select. And then five years later, it might be up into the choice grade. That's our average marble. We also go back to cattle facts and we ask them to give us update, updated price predictions. Okay, generally, those don't change a lot. Generally, what we see, and we've done that over time a few times, over time we've updated the parameters, we don't see major changes, changes that are going to cause a, uh, the apple cart to get over. Sire's going to write, yeah, Don. You know, one trait that comes up a lot of these indexes has to do with calving east direct. And is a bull that's plus 20 really that much better than a bull that's plus 10? I mean, do you get to a point where increasing the increment on KV's direct really has no better or no more return? And I think that's one of the questions that comes up quite a bit is, you know, is there a threshold where if they're above a certain level, it has no more impact on the index? 
Yeah, and, and that gets actually to Craig's question. And at some point in time, obviously, if you don't have any calving problems in your heifers, if you have no calving, really in your cows, we're already at a point in our modern population of cattle, we really have very little to no problem in cows. But in heifers, certainly there are differences, and that's what that calving is EP is going to predict. If you've gotten to a point where you just flat don't have any calving problems in your heifers, then obviously increasing calving ease anymore beyond that probably is not going to be worthwhile. But the thing is, our API index is, it's what it says, all purpose. So it's for, you're going to breed, you're going to take your sires and breed them across all ages. So it does factor in the ability to, of a bull to calve on heifers. And you will notice that it puts a fair bit of emphasis on actually on survival rate, but indirectly then on calving ease. But the other thing that's happening there, people think, well, it's putting so much, it's way more emphasis on calving ease than it should. The other thing that's going on that's indirectly related is, what's a characteristic of a typical calving ease bull as far as the size of his dogs? It's gonna be smaller, right? What do smaller cows do, generally? They eat less. They eat less. Smaller cows eat less, and as we've shown up here, mature weight is part of the prediction of cow intake. So it's not just the ability of a Cavanese bull to calf, it's the fact that they generally tend to be smaller, mature size, therefore they're going to eat less. Now, here's an interesting thing, and I'll just close up quick, because I can tell you, we need some bright your eyes and floating. <laughs> so, so anyway, what's interesting about these indexes is I would say it's been about five years since there's been a real uptake. And, and like Tom Foster would say, he says it's important on the battlefield to row together, to be in the same boat. What indexes tend to do is get us all rowing together. Okay. And what we've seen over the last five years is that in every single trait, every single EPD we have, and I don't know, there's 15 of them, they've improved. Every single trait has improved. Now, one of the criticisms, common criticisms of the API is, boy, if you select for API, you can't get any growth. Well, we've been selecting for API pretty heavily the last five years, and our growth is actually, we were level for many years, probably a decade, decade and a half, since we started on API, we've actually increased in growth because API does reward growth. It just doesn't put it at the top of the total pole. Like back in the 80s, we had it at the top of the total pole, which is really not where growth should be. So anyway, that's the end of my epistle here. And this, this yeah, Catherine or Jackie put up, uh, put up our, it's kind of like the food pyramid. The, uh, the most the traits that get the most weightings are at the top, and this is for API, and you move down to the bottom, and they get the least weighting, but that doesn't mean they don't have an influence on the index, it just means they have less of an influence. So if you look, you see uh, weaning weight, you know, it's down there on the third tier, but it still gets a positive weighting. Uh, average daily gain gets a positive weighting. Carcass weight in there. Would, be a proxy for average data again. So anyway, with that, go uh, take care of whatever you need to take care of. Thank you, Wade.